right? So we knew the halocarbons were not probably the right uh, source, and people tried to model it just for short, and then you don't get anything out. And then we went through a, a several of these. I'm not going to go through in detail these reactions. Um, people have tried to simulate uh, nitrogen um, oxide reactions, uh, halogenated strong acid reactions, activation of um, that govern the release of uh, halogens via this equilibrium reaction. But the main take-home message is this. If when you look at seawater, the concentration of iodine is just but so low, you, you're not going to get anything out of it. So is this still a similar problem? Where is it going to come from? Okay. So this image um, is a satellite image taken by Skiamaki, which is a satellite, uh, and people use it for various things, but primarily some pe people use it for halogens. And uh, if you look at this plot, this is just, uh, it shows you a lot of red stuff over here, right? Um, IO, and that's high in concentration. And IO is a species that's formed from reaction of iodine which is wondering, we're wondering where all of this is coming from to give such high concentrations of this, which people measure, right? So if we look at this satellite image and we see that it's all around the edge, that means that maybe uh, some of the sources are around there too, right? Um, and uh, this is an icebreaker image. You c it's not really the, necessarily the best image, but this brown stuff uh, might provide some clues. And some people in the probably know what that brown stuff is. Yes. <laughs> yeah, this brown stuff is, uh, didn't get the equilibrium signal, but it's just a um, different form of algae. This is macroalgae. And the reason I put this here is before I came into the picture, you know, you had botanists doing a lot of work on algae, right? And they've done a lot of work showing what? Just this that uh, uh, algae is a huge reservoir of iodine, right? So maybe, um, so when I knew about that, I started to wonder, you know, uh, how much, uh, you know, diet, how much um, algae is in the Arctic and Antarctic? I didn't know anything about this. But then I came to the conclusion after reading several books and all et cetera, that uh, Antarctic is the largest uh, reservoir of um, diatoms in the world, right? It has the largest per area, anywhere in the world. So we got a lot of it there, but they're not, they're not macroalgae, they're microalgae, diatoms primarily, right? Various uh, types. And for some reason, these uh, species, whether they're macro or microalgae, they like iodine. <laughs> they like to take it up. And um, this is just a mechanism that show of the... Uh, of what people hypothesize, through it all, who's a botanist, of how iodine may be taken up by um, an algae cell, where you have um, apoplastic oxidases. These are sources of hydrogen uh, oxide, which is then used to, um, of course, oxidize iodine. And if you can have this uh, catalyst there, haloperoxidase, which is, um, you can have haloperoxidase or you, uh, vanadium is also, they have metal catalysts as well that have been discovered in algae to catalyze this reaction to uh, hopoidous acid, HOI, which can then react with organic matter, which can then go through this route and then de um, go through a deionation reaction to then release that iodine, or you can get hopoidous acid being reduced uh, accumulated within the cells of the algae, right? And this really happens very efficiently in the winter. The real reasons I don't know, but I figure it's cold, no sunlight, I need to survive if I'm algae. Maybe iodine is something they really like <laughs> to survive. So maybe some survival mechanism, I'm not sure. Um, so the nice thing is that people have done measurements to compare the amount of iodine in seawater compared to uh, different algae, right? And they found that they accumulate so much that um, it could be maybe the source we're looking for. Accumulates about four orders of magnitude and much more iodine compared to seawater, right? So seawater has a concentration of about 10 to the minus seven molar iodine. Um, and algae in general can have about 10 to the minus three molar. And that's a lot of, it's a huge jump, right? 
And their release is, is primarily governed by these two equilibrium reactions here. Oxidation of iodine um, to poetis acid, which during the springtime, you can get uh, to the metabolic activity. And then oxidative stress also increases the metabolic activity of these algae and you get efficient release of I2, okay? And uh, the equilibrium, and I'll say this again, the equilibrium here fi lies very far to the right. The, so the, what I'm saying is the rate of reaction to here uh, is uh, several orders of magnitude less compared to here. Um, and this is just a, um, a pictorial uh, diagram of what I would be believe is going on. You have algae on the side of the sea ice. You also have algae, of course, mixed in with brine channels and throughout the sea ice. And then you have um, uh, diffusion through these brine channels and up through the sea ice. Um, and then efficient chemistry within this uh, layer that's on top of sea ice, this kind of mobile layer, uh, what we call this uh, quasi-liquid layer, which causes efficient reactions to happen, and then further release to participate in well-established tropospheric chemistry. Right. So uh, does, that all, does that all work, actually? <laughs> um, so we, do, we have created this multi-phase model, multi-phase meaning it's explicitly linked in the model with differential equations in the atmosphere, to that in the ice phase. And that's very tough to do because most models are just one phase, right? You have gas phase models or condensed phase models. But linking the two can be a bit tough in runtime. And, and, and of course, you need some way to parameterize that as well. So we developed this model called Conair. And it had typical gas phase chemistry. Um, and, uh, then we included aqueous phase chemistry and all this Aqueous phase chemistry were derived from experiments in my thesis in conjunction with collaborators in Germany who did a lot of halogen chemistry. And then uh, heterogeneous uptake and release, and then photochemical reactions, which were calculated offline using a radiative transfer code. And we used fixed law, first and second law, to handle the change in diffusive flux from the algae and also the change in concentration uh, gradient from the top of the sea ice down to the bottom. Oh, and this, so how did, uh, and this, these are just pictures for the grad students out there <laughs> to show you uh, that what you do um, even through your, your grad school is really important. So there would be no way I could do this, have done this study if I didn't do my thesis work. Ice chemistry and physics was really the predominant stuff in my thesis. Um, I did a lot of planetary work as well, but it was very heavy in ice chemistry and physics. And this was a project I did at Georgia Tech um, using a two-photon laser and fluorescent instrument. And I created a um, <laughs> homemade apparatus where I spray froze ice. And I rated, the, rated them with um, different wavelengths of light to constrain how NOx affected ozone correlations in the troposphere. And published, had a lot of fun. But the main point is that it gave me a good idea of how gas phase species really behave in ice, the kinetics, right? And those kinetics really helped me uh, be able to extrapolate quantitatively of other species, such as halogens as well, right? Um, and so I mentioned something in that diagram. I mentioned that the things diffuse up and then they're at this layer, this quasi-liquid layer, right? And what really happens is that if you have a glass of water, for instance, let's say, um, and then you have, uh, you, dump, you dump two things in there that you know are going to react, like iodine and ozone, right? For instance, somehow you can inject iodine gas in the water, et cetera, and uh, ozone and look at them react. And then you freeze it, right? Um, what happens is that most solutes actually segregate from, and this is a scanning electron microscopy, uh, microscope image, a low temperature SEM image, about minus 11 degrees Celsius looking at ice. And what you see here, this is a water vein. It's about um, 50 microns thick or so, this water vein. And this is the ice lattice here, right? And so most things when you freeze them, they actually segregate from the ice lattice and just 
I think because uh, some higher power wants life to, to really exist a little bit easier, um, they actually just migrate in these, these regions here. And that's where most of the chemistry happens, okay? So, um, and this is just a pictorial diagram showing the same thing. You just have a smaller space, then you know, people are going to interact more. And I was able to quantify that uh, using um, a certain cross-sectional area of uh, snowpack. I can quantify the amount of um, the thickness of this QLL layer, which in turn can give me the total water content and then the total water volume. But the main take-home message is this, um, where is it here? This, uh, I didn't put it here. Um, is this volumetric factor, uh, da -da -da. yeah, this volumetric factor, which you derive quantitatively. So if you don't have this volumetric factor, when we did the simulations, just using straight aqueous phase chemistry, you cannot reproduce the results because it doesn't really represent what really happens in the ice, um, the ice phase, based on a lot of experiments, not just mine. So this was a very crucial parameter, and the rest are just really components of how each of these gases, whether they're second, first, or order reactions, how fast they escape from the surface and then re replenish the surface. And we conducted these simulations, and um, this plot here uh, represents the evolution of the aqueous phase components, iodide, I2, and IBR. And the, ooh, here we go again. Uh, <laughs> this, this plot here represents the evolution of I2 as a function of time um, over six days, okay? So the measure measurements that we were matching um, really, the peak of iodine release really approaches at about 70, 65 to 70 days after polar uh, sunrise, right? So it has a lot of time to actually diffuse through these sea ice. And so we use a very conservative of, uh, way of parameterizing the model. We stated we didn't add any replenishment sources to iodine. We just assumed that it had an initial source and then it would be depleted over some amount of days. And we were able to um, reproduce the destruction rate of ozone on this plot here, match, match the field experiments well, um, and also the evolution of iodinated such as IO and OIO. And the hypoidous acid that deposits and then uh, re-emits, but the take-home message is that we were able to reproduce uh, field measurements fairly well. And this, uh, so this was, again, written 2007, I understand? And so um, when I did this, we did this uh, so, uh, together as a postdoc when the two authors here, and um, so we were very happy. We were very happy. Actually, this is a tidbit. Actually, Afonso and I, we won the, uh, one of the first uh, research awards for intellectual uh, <laughs> innovativeness at JPL because of this project. And um, it started a lot of, uh, made a, it was pretty controversial. I'm not sure, you know, I guess people have various modes of sensitivity. Um, but it was very controversial for whatever reason. And I think it was controversial because, you know, we came out there and said, you know, this is something new. We created a new type of model. This was the first multi-phase model created. And model did very well, stating, you know, iodine can really, if you take into account ice chemistry and physics, can really simulate um, ozone depletion events in the Antarctic very well. And um, we actually found out something even more interesting. So this problem of uh, tropospheric ozone depletion events was around before I came. And people could not fundamentally, until this day, cannot fundamentally, with a multi-phase model, explicitly tell you why ozone depletion events happen in the polar regions, in the Arctic, derived from bromine, right? And I'll explain why that is in this, uh, no, no, I'll go this way. Um, I, I, I'll go back, uh, don't worry, I'll go back. And I wanted to point out, this. when we, we tried the model, bromine as well. And I remember I mentioned that the, uh, the equilibrium rate constant, uh, the reaction rate for this way to this way for iodine, it falls far to the right, right? So you can imagine this being I2, um, 
Yeah, and then this being HLI, right? So that so it's not surprising that we're getting a lot of I2 out. And so when we try to do the same thing for bromine, we realize that nothing comes out. You can stuff um, PPBs of bromine in there. It's not going out. And the reason being is that its equilibrium far is far to the left. And it's even, uh, so it's nothing coming out. So um, my committee member, Paul Wentworth, when he, they coined this bromine explosion, um, and Paul is a very well-respected scientist um, from Harvard. He's a professor at Caltech. Uh, um, I talked to him about this, and he was a bit proud. <laughs> he was a bit, uh, you know, he, he was a bit, um, he wasn't surprised because he never actually tried to do it himself. But it, we were very happy to realize why people could not solve it and know why no one actually published a really true mechanism about it. Now, um, so why haven't people observed this in the Arctic? All right, and that, that was another question that came into our minds. And from my understanding, the Arctic and Antarctica has a few, uh, actually it's fundamental differences, of course, in the concentration of diatoms, right? Quantitatively, I can't tell you how different they are, but um, the consensus is that Antarctica has the largest amount of diatoms in the world. So that's a qualitative argument. But quantitatively, the sea ice thickness um, is uh, much thinner in the Antarctic, around the Antarctic edge. So the diffusion time scales is a function of depth. For typical uh, diffusion rates, these are the more realistic diffusion rates that would happen in ice. Um, are just a lot faster in Antarctica, right? So I remember I mentioned it takes about 70 days for you to reach the peak of iodine to destroy ozone, so we have a lot of time, right? Assuming these two diffusion rates that have been measured in the lab for gas species and ice are applicable. Of course, this would never work, <laughs> right? Um, and then the, the third thing is that Arctic region actually is predominantly made up of columnar ice. Um, around the sea ice, and the Antarctic is made up of, of uh, platelet and then phrasal ice. And then as further you get in, it becomes more um, um, fast ice. But the, the key thing about that is that the, the fusion of gases in these types of ices are very different. And surprisingly, you have faster diffusion in uh, platelet and uh, phrasal ice compared to columnar ice, and people have showed that in the lab. So we had three kind of points supporting um, why it could be different, but uh, last spring, a German group actually did a measurement in the Arctic over uh, Polinnes, these regions that kind of uh, may have uh, small pools of water, and they measured sub-PPTs, not like 22 PPT of IO, but sub-PPT one or two, or a fraction of PPT of IO, and this is something we predicted in 2007, that eventually you would see it, um, no one's observed it straight off of the ice, but uh, we're not surprised that you are seeing it now because we know the Antarctic ice is getting a lot thinner. Um, so, uh, so we are very uh, happy about that. We went through, and I'm a very open person about uh, this, and I think it's good for the, um, to be open about how things go. Um, uh, we, I think we rejected about four or five times in this paper, and um, you know, when I give a talk, and she's, she's there, uh, she, excuse me, uh, Carpenter, Lucy Carpenter, is, uh, she's a senior um, personnel in the iodine community. Um, so now that I reached out to her last year after some political, uh, anyways, so it's, it's, it then, <laughs> that, it then that made this, the, made it a lot easier. But in a nutshell, she, she did cause me a lot of problems. I mean, to be very frank, I was very, I was so annoyed with this lady, this her, and she knows it. And we, we, you know, so this is not something that's not known to the community. People know this, but at the end of the day, last year, I reached out to her and I said, you know, I don't, you know, let's, let's get together. <laughs> I mean, I need her, right? So, because she was rejecting all my papers. Uh, <laughs> especially she was rejecting this one, so. So we worked together, and she really added value to the revised manuscript, which after several years, people did measurements on other species of diatoms, 
showing that we were right anyways. There are fluxes of iodine. And, um, and one of the other things that people, um, and she as well, knocked on um, using other people, uh, ice physics, physicists were um, this particular rule called Rule of Fives. I think it was developed by a professor at University of Iowa. He's more of a mathematician slash physicist that stated that you don't have permeability in ice below <laughs> minus five degrees Celsius at uh, this a really low salinity to that really doesn't really happen in the real world at five gram per, you know, five percent per mil. I don't know where that you find that in the Arctic and Antarctica, because usually it's over 35 to uh, per mil. And, um, and so I had to, yeah, so we, we learned a lot from each other and learned that that theory, you can't apply it to the real world. And I think it was very useful for the atmospheric science community who was really trying to get involved with explicit modeling and understanding um, how things behave in ice, because every you know you these uh, I haven't been to the Arctic, but he has, and she, and she has been there many times. And a lot of people people have been to the Arctic, especially since the late 90s, measuring anything you can think of right off the ice and uh, below what uh, you know minus 30 degrees Celsius, minus 40, you know. So the fact that things can come up through the ice is not like it's a woo, you know. <laughs> A grand Doist discovery. This is kind of common sense, I would think. Um, so we got that understanding out of the way, and there were satellite, uh, actually satellite data to show that you have abundance of emissions, especially of like CO2 and halogens in the winter when the temperatures in Antarctica are just extremely cold, right? So this was, and she brought this out in me. I mean, I could be very stubborn too. So, you know, in, in the mind you feel that, oh, I don't need to put this on the paper. People should know that, right? Uh, and then, so we, ha we created a really nice revised manuscript. And re enhancing what we did before, but really giving the community what um, it should have been given f uh, seven years ago. That's a lot of citations, by the way, seven years. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, to show in the arena that why bromine chemistry in the Arctic really can't be modeled this way. But the real key thing here is there are two things. The volumetric factor created by this enhanced reaction between species um, in the ice. And then also, of course, the source of uh, iodine, right? Those are the two key factors. And we're using this model. Of, we've used it before to publish a paper together uh, when I, we were postdocs. Um, how NOx really correlates to ozone depletion events. So we use the multi-phase model for that. And uh, we're submitting, a, we actually submitted a paper recently with uh, collaborators in South Korea about the influence of um, this uh, equilibrium reaction of I2 and iodide to form triiodide minus, um, which in turn can then release I2. Um, uh, to the contribution of some measurements they did in the coastline Antarctica. So it was a very nice study. Did there, 